Hello everybody, this is Mr. McKeever here, and today we're going to talk about the Soviet Union totalitarianism. Take a wonderful look at this picture here. This is the uh, wonderful Joseph Stalin. He's going to be our star of today's show. But let's bring it up to Stalin first. The last time you remember we talked about the Soviet Union, it's really the story of Lenin. Uh, Lenin has finally kind of removed the now-fledgling Soviet Union from World War I, and... While he is still trying to deal with things in the Russian Revolution, uh, he's implementing policies that doesn't exactly make the Russian people ecstatic that he is their leader. We call this war communism. The idea behind it is that Lenin's going to centralize every aspect of the Russian economy and helps to really kind of fund his war effort. Because reality is, folks, that the Bolsheviks were not the majority in Russia. They were actually a pretty significant minority compared to the rest of the Russian population. So if they were going to win this Russian Civil War, they kind of had to take control and control every aspect of life for the average person and put it towards their war effort. So this was going to be a little rough for the average person in Russia. They were not going to look forward to this. It was going to be something where food was going to become scarce, and it really doesn't really show a benefit to them. In fact, in reality, it probably makes most of the Russian people leery at best of communism in that's only if they didn't outright hate it by the time the Civil War itself was over. But eventually it is over, and when it is over, Stalin, uh, Lenin, and Trotsky are going to become the new triumvirate of the Soviet Union. Lenin being at the top with his two assistants, Stalin and Trotsky, aiding him in his process. He is going to look to reorganize the Soviet Union now into a country that's going to be much more beneficial to the actual people in Russia, built around the peasantry itself. Uh, he, unlike Marx, believed instead of industrialized worker being the key to communism, it was actually the peasant that was going to be the key to spreading the communist revolution around the world. So in order to do this, he wants to rebuild the Russian economy. He's going to do something that's very counterintuitive to the notion of what really a full communist revolution would be, and that is what he calls the new economic policy. And it actually includes small forms of capitalism, particularly focused on improving the life of the average farmer, allowing them to take their basic things that they make, and then what isn't sent to the government as part of the whole uh, communist revolution is actually allowed for the farmer themselves to sell for a profit. And this is going to allow for a lot of growth in the Russian economy and for a rebuilding process that takes place after World War I now to really reset the new Soviet Union to an era of relative prosperity. And this is going to be a great time period for Russia and really for Lenin, but it's not something that's going to have a lot of universal support. Even within his own party, Stalin is going to have this huge resentment towards his policy, believing that it really is a betrayal of what communism is supposed to be. But for the average person in Russia, it's extraordinarily useful. And this is a great idea. It's really what Russia needed at this time in order to really set itself up for the next era of its history. Because... Their goal is not just to keep the Soviet Union communist, but to continue that around the world. They, they want communism to grow. They want the revolution to take hold everywhere. So they're actually going to call what we know as the Third International. And if you remember, we've kind of hit each of these little internationals as they pop up as really socialist conventions trying to figure out exactly what is going to be the socialist message that spreads around the world. Well, this one is going to be known as the Common Turn. And it's tied to that name because it's really trying to pull the full essence of communism as the, the face of socialism. The idea of Bolshevik rhetoric, ideology, is going to become the, the linchpin, hopefully, of socialism around the world. Well, this is not going to be met with universal support. In fact, the majority of people in Russia uh, are still leery about this. And really, the rest of Europe is extraordinarily leery about this. We've already talked about how, you know, really basic levels of socialism taking part in Eastern Europe and in Northern Europe and how that's going to be really what saves them from the Great Depression. So the idea of communism is going to be something that's not going to be widely accepted throughout all of Europe. And this is despite Lenin's goals. In fact, probably keeps communism from spreading to the rest of Europe. And socialism really could have been something that latched on earlier than it does because... I believe we've talked about this in class before. Socialism, for the most part, today is the key economic feature of Western Europe. Well, this is going to keep that really from taking place in the 1920s and 30s. So, well done, Lenin. You did a great job. Except not. Good job. You kind of screwed yourself right there. Well, when this happens, this is actually going to start to see the end of Lenin's story in Russia. Lenin's end of going to 
end up having a stroke in 1922, and when he does, he actually begins to lose control of the party. You know, rightfully so. Strokes are pretty debilitating illnesses. And what this does is it opens the door for a power struggle in Russia. Uh, Trotsky and Stalin are the two remaining members of the, the Bolshevik party, two remaining leaders. Trotsky is the really the heart and soul of many people's ideas of what the movement is. You know, he's the leader of the, the army during the revolution. And then there's the Stalin guy. Stalin is different. Uh, he is not this, you know, ideological follower of Lenin in many ways. In fact, he's much more hardline in his beliefs of communism itself. He is hyper-organized. Uh, you see a wonderful picture of him right there, a very young Stalin, as he's starting to really become indoctrinated into the whole socialist movement. He, he is the guy who knows everything about everyone. He knows really what everyone's buttons are in order to be able to push them if needed. He's he's brilliant and yet extraordinarily frightening at the same time. Uh, Stalin is by far the most ruthless between the two of them, and his pursuit of power is going to drive Trotsky not only out of Russia, uh, but across the globe. Remember, Stalin is a secretary. He is a paperwork guy. Trotsky is a military general. Trotsky is so frightened of Stalin, he will flee across the world to Latin America to try to get away from him. And even that will not be enough eventually for for Trotsky. He's, Stalin's going to have him hunted down and killed. But that's just really how Stalin works. And when he finally has control of the Soviet Union, everything begins to change, and, and people really should have just ran for the hills, because even Early on, Lenin did not trust Stalin. He needed him because of his organizational skills and his ability to run things. But he was a frightening human being, and Lenin was aware of this. So this is going to be a problem. Uh, Stalin's going to reshape the Russian government even more, and we introduce what we call now totalitarianism. Totalitarianism is very simply total control over all aspects of life. This is going to be a key feature of this period of European history because we have taken the concept of dictatorship, something that has been you know, revolutionized again and again throughout history, and we're now adding a modern spin to it. Now take a post-industrialized dictatorship and all of that you know, extra resources you have available, now you can call it totalitarianism, where you use propaganda and censorship to really indoctrinate a group of people in a country to believe only what you believe and then after that anyone who speaks out against you you pff, gone goodbye nice knowing you get out of here uh and this is going to be how stalin runs things you start at the age of an infant and you begin teaching using propaganda and using schools you indoctrinate them to whatever you believe and in stalin's russia what they believed is that stalin would for all intents and purposes god except there was no god Stalin was the state, and we must worship the state. Anything that spoke out against this was removed. Book burnings, whatever it took, everything was controlled by Stalin. It was a period of time in Europe, and eventually throughout the globe, where freedom of speech just did not happen. And this is what Stalin will espouse in the Soviet Union. And it's rough. The changes that he's going to propose as part of this totalitarian state are going to have dramatic impacts over every aspect of life in the Soviet Union. First up, we're going to see a massive reindustrialization of the Soviet Union. Uh, this is the most dramatic attempt to industrialize the Soviet Union since the time of Peter the Great. Now, there have been other attempts to do it as time has gone on, but this is going to be the most profound one. We call these five-year plans. These five-year plans are brutal industrialization periods. We're talking about how you have to reach a quota. If you do not reach that quota, you die. So they did. Uh, the improvement in industrialization is astro astronomically impressive. But we're talking millions are dead in the process. Millions dead. And this is where Russia's moniker for Stalin, the man of steel, is born. Uh, his profound love of industrialization and his sheer coldness to the loss of human life is going to make him, people believe he's at best a robot. Well, that's awful. But folks, it's not over yet. It's only going to get progressively worse. Once he starts industrializing Russia, he decides we need to change the food production of Russia.
And this is in stark contrast to what Lenin believed. Or Lenin thought the peasants were the future of Russia, was the future of communism. While Stalin doesn't believe the peasants are working hard enough, so in order to create more food, he collectivizes the farms. He masses them into massively state-controlled farms. We're talking thousands upon thousands of people per farm. And they are, again, told to reach this quota. The quotas were designed to in allow there to be enough food for the industrial production of Russia. And they did so at the expense of the actual farmers themselves, who began to starve. These massive farms called kulaks, again, left millions of people dead. Millions of people. Alright then. Still not done. Now we've reached the coup de grace of Joseph Stalin. And that is the purge. Unlike the wonderful horror movies that come across the last few years in American society, these purges are significantly more frightening. Uh, Stalin himself becomes unsure of his own control, and in the late 1930s believes that he is going to remove any threat to his control from Russia. This begins by listing thousands of people to be sent off into work camps across in Siberia, which were essentially a death sentence, or just to be outright killed. These could be members of the Communist Party. These could be people he grew up with. These could be people he's never met before. You really had no idea as to what was going on, because the numbers continued to swell and swell and swell. We went from a couple thousand to 40,000 to 225,000. And since these will become a repetitive thing throughout the course of Stalin's life, we're talking millions again killed under Stalin's control out of his quest for complete control over everything in Russia. The purges are a global catastrophe. Uh, they are millions of people slaughtered, massacred, worked to death over the course of Stalin's reign. And... Most times in history, someone would have been overthrown because of this, but because of the control that Stalin had, it isn't even questioned. These purges will destroy any notion of resistance to Stalin's efforts. I remember Trotsky, yeah, he, he finally hunts him down across the world in Latin America and has him killed. Uh, anyone, you're done. So, we reach the age of Stalin. Uh, totalitarianism, the Soviet Russia, and we can start to see the pieces, the groundwork for what eventually will become the Cold War later on, as people in the United States are horrified as to what's going on. And it's a really interesting scenario because Stalin himself will become one of the most outspoken uh, dictators in world history. And as you can see from the list, some of these people are people we've covered before, some of them we have not because they're modern age people, but King Leopold in Belgium. Uh, Hitler, who we will talk about in the next couple days, and then Stalin himself. Uh, the death toll over the course of Stalin's life will range. Some will equate it to about 20 million. Uh, some estimates have it up to 50, depending on whether or not you take into account the uh, deaths of Russians during World War II, largely due to Stalin's refusal to have his soldiers retreat or surrender. Uh, if so, Stalin becomes the second greatest dictator in terms of death toll in human history, the greatest in European history by far. Uh, but that's the legacy that he will leave in Russia as the man of steel, the iron dictator, the man who will reform the world through his image or no image at all. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful day, and I'll talk to you this week.